I'm David Abulafia, and my new book, In Succession to the History of the Mediterranean, which Le Belles Lettres has already published, is uh, an even more ambitious uh, project. It's a history of the oceans. Now, the oceans are a very different sort of space to the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, and one can also think of other seas with a similar sort of character, is an enclosed space. And in the case of the Mediterranean, contact between the northern and southern shores, or indeed between the western and the eastern shores, has always been relatively easy. But when we look at oceanic spaces, we're looking at something which have always been a much greater challenge to navigators. So that those who wished to navigate, for instance, from the Mediterranean, all the way to Flanders or England in the Middle Ages, or going even further back, the Phoenicians who took routes through the Strait of Gibraltar and then up the coast of Spain, probably reaching Brittany and possibly even Britain. These people were venturing into very different waters uh, where the challenge and knowledge about the environment that they were entering was much more limited, which itself generated an enormous amount of mythology about the sea, and particularly the Atlantic Ocean. So what I'm trying to do is, as with my book on the Mediterranean, I'm trying to offer a human perspective, because we have to remember that although humans cannot really live on the sea, well, they can live in islands, obviously, in the middle of the sea, they can survive for a time on ships in the middle of the sea, but essentially it is an alien environment, it's a hostile environment, and yet it is also the setting in which we have to remember 70% of the surface of the earth is actually covered by sea. So it's something which has played an extremely important part in human life, in the history of migration, uh, in the history of trade, and also the building of empires. So what I try to do in the book is to look in the first place at the three great oceans. There's also a certain amount about the Arctic Ocean. But I concentrate on these very large spaces and how humans have managed to master these spaces, beginning with the Pacific, because it is there that we find that Polynesians were playing a really important role in expanding ever further eastwards over many thousands of years until they reached Easter Island, and as we now know, even reached South America and returned back to Polynesia. So there's an extraordinary story there of the development of tremendous navigational skills. And that takes one right through um, the, the centuries. But then if we look at the Indian Ocean, and in the Indian Ocean, I would also include the waters off the coast of China, so the South China Sea, uh, the waters going all the way up to Korea and Japan, which were very intimately linked to the Indian Ocean through trade. We're looking at a very different sort of setting in which very intensive commercial networks came into existence. Nowadays, we hear a great deal about the history of the Silk Road, and this is something which most historians would rather qualify the statement uh, which is said to have stretched all the way from Eastern Europe right across to China at various points in the early Middle Ages, in the Mongol period, and so on. But what we actually know, and with the evidence from shipwrecks, we can really bolster this argument, is that the maritime route of the sea, bringing goods all the way from China or the East Indies, up the Red Sea and then actually feeding them into the Mediterranean sometimes or into uh, Islamic countries in the Middle East. This was a much more act active set of connections and it was also uh, 
a, uh, a much more continuous set of connections. <laughs> the overland Silk Route came and went, but this was something which really carried on for many centuries. So that becomes the focus of the second part of the book. And then in the third part of the book, perhaps surprisingly, I look at the Atlantic, because you might think that the Atlantic before 1492, before Columbus's great voyage to the Caribbean, that there's not much to say. I mean, there, there's the story of the Vikings who undoubtedly reached America and whose settlements in Greenland lasted for 400 years. So there is something to say there, but there's actually a lot more as well when we take into account particularly the Atlantic flank of Europe stretching all the way down from the North Sea and then across the through the English Channel uh, and then right down to southern Spain and probably beyond that, but we don't have the archaeological evidence. So having dealt with all these areas, then what I have to cope with in the book is the enormous transformation that took place in 1492 and 1497 as a result of Columbus crossing the Atlantic and Vasco da Gama setting out on his voyage which created a sea route to India. So in the next part of the book, I talk about what I call the Great Acceleration, when these three oceans were drawn together and the emphasis, because otherwise the story becomes impossible to tell, it becomes a, a story with so much detail, so much richness. So what I concentrate on is very much the relationship between the different oceans, and here the Arctic Ocean also comes in because of attempts to create routes linking the Atlantic to the Pacific around the top of Russia. And this goes way back in time to the 16th century. When we look at navigation nowadays, when we think of those enormous container ships and those enormous cruise ships, we realise that the way we relate to the oceans, the amount of goods crossing the oceans, the number of people crossing the oceans, the safety of the oceans, that all this has changed enormously. So it is on that note that I draw the book to an end, coming right up to the present day, but having started back in time many tens of thousands of years ago. <laughs>